Today we are here with special guest Steve Worth, director of the Sifa Hollywood Animation Archive. You might recognize base. him from the breadcrumb segment with Skip and Steve. That's me. You recognize that voice? But we're not here to talk about music today. Uh, we're actually going to talk to Steve about his research at the archive and uh, what sort of things the research is turning up because I hear it's interesting. People, when they see know us just from the blog, they kind of have an idea that, you know, I'm some giant brain sitting behind a desk and spewing out information. But the truth of the matter is that I really don't know everything. I, I only know little bits and pieces here and there. And what I'm doing at the archive and for the last four years I have been doing is learning myself by by following threads and doing like what I talk about in the breadcrumbs segments with music. I'm doing that with with animation and cartooning. I'm tracing the history of animation and the people who made it and the people who made cartoons to try and figure out how they connect and how the branches spread outward and where the roots are and where the, the trunk of the tree is, for instance. And one thing tends to lead me to the next thing. And I'm finding that um, I'm getting a sense now after four years of research of the shape, the general shape and outline of what it is that I'm looking at. And I'm, I'm really surprised because when I started, I thought I, I knew pretty much what there was to know. And every day that I'm here, uh, I find more things that I don't know. So you said that the result of your research here at the archive, what exactly is it that, what are your purposes, what do you hope to achieve by having established this archive? Well, the idea of the CIFA Hollywood Animation Archive isn't for preservation. A lot of people think, you know, it's it's about restoring films and preserving them and and making sure stuff doesn't deteriorate. We do that, but that isn't isn't our primary goal at the archive. Our real goal is to take the knowledge from the past and bring it alive today to inform current modern day animators. And that's that's much more important than just taking the history of animation and pickling it in a jar and setting it on a shelf and saying now it's it's preserved forever. People have a general knowledge of what the history of animation is. They they read the books on the history of animation. They all start the same way as in the old Disneyland TV show. It all starts with cave paintings and they show you the cave paintings in France and then they jump to Windsor McKay and Gertie the Dinosaur and take you up through Disney and Warner Brothers and modern cartoons and and uh, Zagreb and anime and Don Bluth and modern Disney and that's the history of animation. Well, if you're interested in comic books or comic strips, for instance, they may start at uh, Opper's Yellow Kid, which was the first newspaper comic, and say that's where everything starts and then bring you up through all of the newspaper comics and, and comic books and the history of, of superhero comics and all that sort of thing. Well, I'm finding out that there's a lot more for an artist to understand about the history of, of our medium than just that immediate present. There's a history that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years that's pretty much been forgotten at this point. And that because it's forgotten, we have an incorrect perception of what that history is. Uh, there's a story about uh, uh, the blind wise men who are brought to an elephant and asked to describe it. And one of the men grabs the elephant's tail and says, oh, it's, it's very small. It's kind of like a snake. And another blind man takes his foot and feel, it's like the trunk of a tree and another one takes his ear and says it's like the leaf on a on a tree and that's kind of what animation and and recent cartoon history is we're just seeing the tail of an animal that stretches back hundreds of years so what i'm trying to do at the archive is in bits and pieces and breadcrumbs pull these breadcrumbs and bits and pieces together and document all these branching stories to try and get an idea of what the overall shape 
of the history of cartooning and animation is, rather than just the immediate present. So I guess to start off, we should probably have you define animation and then work our way from there. Well, that's that's an interesting thing because uh, I I think right now animation is undergoing big change in that the definition of what animation is is changing. Frank and Ollie in their book defined animation as the illusion of life. But today that isn't necessarily true. What we have today is rotoscoping and motion capture and realistic special effects animation like you see in the Spider-Man movies. And it isn't so much an illusion of life as it is an illusion of naturalistic movement. And that is a part of animation. That is, motion obviously is a big part of animation. But Frank and Ollie, when they were saying the illusion of life, they were thinking of something that was larger than just motion. They were thinking about the essence of what animation was to them, which was cartooning. And they never dreamt that in a million years that animation and cartooning could be separated into two separate things. But well, I think we're finding today that that's happening. So let's define what cartooning is. If we've defined animation as the illusion of naturalistic movement, then what is cartooning? Well, cartooning is using caricature and exaggeration and satire to come up with a, a vision of truth, in, for lack of a better word. Animation and cartooning, when animation has cartooning in, imbued inside of it, it has the power to crystallize a personality. When we look at Bugs Bunny, he's almost more real than our own family members. He's we know who Bugs Bunny is. We know how he thinks. We know how, how he'll react in any given situation. Bugs Bunny is beyond real. He's hyper real. So cartooning has the power through exaggeration and caricature to create a hyper personality. It also has the power to crystallize a point of view to be able to, like with political cartooning, to be able to take a point of view, a, a political statement, and present it in such a clear and concise and incontrovertible way that everyone understands the truth behind it, and it's hard to disagree. So from the research that you've been doing, why don't you go ahead and give us a timeline of animation history as you found it to be, beyond, beyond you know, Gertie, Windsor McKay's Gertie. Okay, I'll, I'll try and kind of, I'm, the interesting thing is, is that right now I'm kind of just realizing and seeing some of these things. So it's the first time I'm putting some of these things in words. So excuse me if I'm kind of stumbling over a little bit of this, but I'll try to throw out breadcrumbs as I go so that you can go and check uh, some of the things that I haven't had time to put up on the blog yet yourself by uh, Googling names and that sort of thing to, to try and figure out what it is that I'm, what the heck it is that I'm talking about here. And we'll, we'll try to put up links too on our, yeah. on our post. That's yeah. a good idea. And we don't have any commercials, so take your time. Oh, okay. <laughs> this episode is brought to you by Cheerios. <laughs> that won't be in there. Well, people, people come to the archive and they ask me about Carl Barks and Freddie Moore and Milt Call and anime and um, Lion King, Little Mermaid. All those things are great and they're all all very important, but they're just the first step of a long road that goes all the way back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So it's important to have the, a frame of reference that extends beyond just modern memory. I, I know it's hard to do because popular culture, most of us get our information about cartoons from popular culture, which is cable TV, which shows pretty much what's recent. There are a few older things like a Bugs Bunny cartoon here and there, or Flintstones, that sort of thing. But when it comes to cartooning of the 1800s, where do you go to find that? Well, it's on the internet, 
But unless you have those breadcrumbs, unless you have the names, you may not even be aware of it. So if we're defining the history of cartooning for Windsor McKay, as you asked, I think you'd have to also backtrack a little bit because there's an overlap. Magazine cartoons were extremely important in the, the 20th century. And probably the single most important pure cartooning was done in Mad Magazine. Harvey Kurtzman, who created the, the comic book version of Mad, that evolved into being something that every boy in America knew about. Wally Wood, Will Elder, Jack Davis, Mort Drucker, uh, Sergio Aragones, a great guy, Don Martin, incredibly funny, and John Kay's been talking about Paul Coker lately. Uh, all of these cartoonists were instrumental in creating the, the point of view, that the modern point of view that led to things like Monty Python. And in fact, um, Terry Gilliam worked for Harvey Kurtzman before he worked for Monty Python. Mm -hmm. the, the, our modern sense of humor can be traced directly to Mad Magazine. It can't be overemphasized how important that is. Well, for the, for the lay person that might be listening, and my mom does listen, so I know they're out there. <laughs> Hi, Mom. <laughs> what decade would Mad Magazine, these people, you know, not Mad Magazine today, but Mad Magazine from when are you referring to? We're talking the 50s through the 60s were, the, were the, the real peak years for Mad Magazine. It started out as a comic book and evolved into being a magazine format. And it's, I think it's, it's still going today. It's it not still. quite, uh, it's, a, it's not quite what it used to be, but I think it's probably one, people take it for granted how important Mad Magazine is to modern humor. I, I don't think that uh, you can overemphasize how important Mad Magazine is. Uh, and I think that's important because 50, you know, you said 50s and 60s was only 50 or 60 years ago. And already most of that information is lost on any formal, as far as I know, or am familiar with, any formal education you really have to go out of your way to find it. And that's only 50 or 60 years ago, and you, you want to go back hundreds of years. Well, part of that is the subversive nature of Mad Magazine. It was meant to be a magazine you hid under your bed so that your mom didn't find it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't think you're going to find college courses in, uh, in satire that uh, are going to analyze Mad Magazine. But artists and cartoonists who... Uh, whose business it is to create satire and humor, Mad Magazine is, is a Bible of information to analyze. Do we have any Mad Magazines here, th physical magazines? No, archive? I don't. We are taking donations. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. A lot of the things that come into the archive come in because someone just happens to have them, and, and it's an ocean of material that we really need to add to the database but it, we add to it as people bring it to us. So if someone has a collection of banned magazine they'd like to let us digitize, we would be very interested. And it's in just to borrow, right? I mean, we can return yeah. it to them. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a DVD that's available with all of the uh, all of the Mad Magazine issues on it. The scans are terrible. Um, <laughs> it's available on Amazon, and it's okay for just kind of a general idea of what Mad Magazine is, but. Uh, we really need for the archive high quality scans of something like that. One of the things we have been documenting that that's also important, like Mad Magazine, is Playboy. We've got lots of those. We got stacks <laughs> of those. And in fact we had a gentleman who came in and brought me a stack of Playboy magazines and he said, I'm giving this to you because my wife said that I had to get rid of them <laughs> and I wanted to tell her that I was donating them to a museum. And, uh, you know, you can laugh about that, but the, the truth is that Harvey Kurtzman and Eric Sokol and Eldon Dadini and Jack Elder, Jack Cole, a brilliant artist, uh, Doug Snide, Phil Interlandi, all of the great Playboy cartoonists are, again, an encyclopedia of information to cartoonists. You can take an Eric Sokol cartoon and just break it down and analyze it for color, composition, character, posing, staging, everything, and it's absolutely the pinnacle of perfection. Lots of this is on the website, so take a look at, I'm not going to talk too much about that, but take a look on the, on the website and you'll find amazing stuff there. 
Esquire magazine was a highbrow satire magazine back in the 30s. Miguel Covarrubias, who again, we did a wonderful article with, with Covarrubias' caricatures, who was the person who Hirschfeld looked to as inspiration. Miguel Covarrubias did great covers for Esquire. George Petty and Alberto uh, Varga, who was later became better known as Vargas in Playboy, did Pinup Girls. Uh, Sid Hoff. There were a lot of really good. Uh, Milk Gross actually drew for Esquire for a while, I believe. Great cartooning, great pinup girls, big great illustration, uh, great caricature. New Yorker was another one. Uh, I was reading on Mark Kennedy's blog the other day where he said he was quoting, uh, I believe, Ollie Johnston saying that uh, New Yorker cartoons were great reference for staging and for clarity in animation, and they really are. They're one panel cartoons that read immediately when you see them. You see the gags. The, the people there were Sam Cobain, who died very young in his career, but made a tremendous mark in single panel cartoons. Charles Adams, who created the Adams Family. Uh, Peter Arno. Peter Arno is a genius. If if you ever happen to see Arno books at a swap meet, pick them up. Whitney Darrow Jr. James Thurber uh, was one of the contributors to The New Yorker. Gardner Ray other people. There were New Yorker is a, is a really uh, important cartooning magazine as well. Collier's was was an important magazine. We've done a lot of posts on Collier's on on the archive site, uh, particularly illustration going all the way back to James Montgomery Flagg, the fellow who did the Uncle Sam Wants You poster, and A.B. Frost, who is a very early um, uh, American comic artist and also did Uncle Remus, the illustri original illustrations for Uncle Remus. Bill Malden, Virgil Parch, William Steig, great cartoonists, all of them. The Saturday Evening Post was a magazine that was, the, the cover of the Post was the pinnacle of illustration, and Norman Rockwell and N.C. Wyeth and J.C. Leyendecker all did covers for the Post, and, and very important magazine in caricature and illustration and depicting what America was in in uh, a one one image that immediately got an idea across. Uh, that's the thing about Norman Rockwell that, that is his genius, is the clarity. And in cartooning, clarity is the thing that makes, is, is like the laser beam that carries the idea across. Uh, so you, you can really learn a lot from illustrators for that sort of thing. Now, going back a little further before the 30s and uh, the 20s, which was the uh, peak of magazines, during the World War I era, which we've documented a lot in Cartoons Magazine, we, we have a couple of posts on that on the, on the archive site, political cartoons were very important because worldwide issues at that point were uh, making a a place for political cartoonists to, to comment on current events. Ding Darling was probably one of the greatest uh, political cartoonists of all time. He was an editorial cartoonist on the Des Moines Register. He won a Pulitzer Prize. And beyond just being a great cartoonist, he was a conservationist and was responsible for uh, working with politicians and motivating people through his editorial cartoons to create a National Wildlife Refuge, which now carries his name, the Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge. Where's that? It's in Iowa, I believe. And he was he was uh, big with waterfowl. He he wanted to preserve wetlands for for ducks and that sort of thing. Uh, that that to me is really yeah, inspirational, I suppose, because it's good to see people taking our medium, which a lot of a lot of parents tend to throw away when their kids move off to college, but it's nice to see someone taking that and doing something constructive and meaningful and relevant as a, a benevolent contribution to society in general. When you have a bully pulpit like an editorial cartoonist does, um, and when you have an art form like cartooning that is so powerful when it comes to motivating people, and uh, making issues very clear to people, it's almost a crime not to, to use that. Another one in the same era as Ding Darling, uh, Louis Raymaker, was a Dutch uh, landscape painter. And he wasn't even a very good 
landscape painter. Who would want to be? <laughs> <laughs> well, there were there were great Dutch kid, landscape painters, but he was he was just a general artist, and got a job on a newspaper uh, in Holland and and heard reports that the Germans were invading Belgium and heard reports of atrocities. He didn't believe what he heard, so he snuck across the border and witnessed for himself German soldiers executing people, just terrible things happening. And he went back to his newspaper and started creating editorial cartoons about it. The cartoons were so powerful that they started to uh, motivate worldwide passions against Germany. And the Kaiser put a bounty on his head, dead or alive, for anyone who wanted to execute him. You know, we talk now about Dutch cartoonists with uh, bounties on their head from Muslim terrorists. Mm -hmm. Here's a Dutch cartoonist in World War I where German Kaiser had a, a bounty on his head. Uh, at that time, Holland was neutral, and Germany pushed Holland to put Raymakers on trial for endangering Dutch neutrality. He was acquitted, but as the noose was tightening around his neck with the, with the bounty on his head and the political pressures that the Germans were putting on, on the Dutch government at that time, he fled to Britain, where he was received as a hero. Uh, he drew cartoons for the London Times and worked with the British Propaganda Bureau to create pamphlets that kept the British public aware of what was happening on the mainland um, when it came to the war issues. Uh, these propaganda pamphlets were incredibly powerful and often stepped over the line into things that weren't true, exaggerating what the Germans were doing, uh, raping and pillaging and, and uh, desecrating churches and that sort of thing, that weren't necessarily true. But it's clear that Raymaker, as he illustrated them, believed that they were true. There, there was an honesty to the way he presented this information. And the conflict and his work raised a person who is an average landscape painter to being probably the most important cartoonist of his era. Theodore Roosevelt said that uh, Louis Raymaker did more than any other civilian to win World War I. Uh, his cartoons were probably instrumental in convincing the American public when they were syndicated to American newspapers. Um, they convinced the American public to enter the war, which changed the whole landscape of, of World War I. I think I think that the skeptical or casual listener would find it maybe find it hard to believe that a cartoonist could have so much power, especially in today's world. It's so easy to obtain media examples, you know, from off the internet. You can just mm -hmm. get physical video of what's happening or firsthand accounts instantaneously. But it, I think it's important to note that in World War One's time, the world would have been a lot slower in terms of transfer of information. You know that. They don't have the proliferation of media in the same way that we have it today. So I think that I just think it's important to mention that illustration in that time could be extremely powerful. Well, they say a picture is worth a, a, a thousand words, and that's absolutely true. When you read about war, it's nothing like seeing an image of it. Mm -hmm. And when when an image of war is caricatured, and you're seeing not just an image of devastation, but you're seeing the political forces that are causing that symbolized within that, that cartoon. It's incredibly powerful. And a lot of wars are won and lost by the motivation of the countries involved in them. It, the soldiers are the one on the front line fighting the war, but it's the will of the people in the countries behind the soldiers, behind the front lines that uh, actually make it possible to win the wars. So it's probably why we're having such a problem in Iraq. <laughs> yeah. Well, people, people nowadays have a tendency to believe that propaganda is a bad thing. 
and it's not necessarily. Well, it definitely has a negative connotation. It has a negative connotation. And the thing is, is that you need in, when you're faced with a challenge, you need to be able to motivate everyone to move in one direction. It's kind of like, you know, if everyone's herding cats, uh, things don't happen. And when you're being attacked by an invading force and you're disorganized like that and you're, you're, the will of your country isn't unified, then you're at risk. And anyone who can bring together and galvanize the will of a people can make a, a huge difference. And that's exactly what Louis Raymaker did. Yeah. The interesting thing is that after World War I, he uh, returned to being a landscape painter, did a few political cartoons around the beginning of World War II, but never achieved that prominence again. During the period of World War I, he did over 2,000 cartoons. He was working at a lightning speed to do a cartoon almost every day or two cartoons a day and was just knocking these things out and making a difference. And after the war, when the, the passion wasn't there, he settled back down into the life that he had come from. So it's interesting that an artist can be raised up by events, that, that things can, can raise you up. I'm working right now on digitizing the, a massive collection of his World War I cartoons, and I'm going to be making it available as a PDF book for sale on the archive site. So I'll have a lot more to say about Louis Raymaker in the, in the next few weeks. But moving on in our chronology here, now we're back to about 1900, and at this point, again, magazine cartoons are the are the uh, uh, driving force of cartooning. Punch magazine was a British humor magazine that's the granddaddy of all comic magazines. It it was published from 1841 to 1992, 150 years. Um, the cartoonists that worked on it included John Tenniel, who. Uh, uh, illustrated Alice in Wonderland, uh, Phil May, John Leach, E. H. Shepard, the guy who did uh, Winnie the Pooh, uh, Arthur Rackham. We have some great stuff on the archive site about him. Trog, we have things on the archive site about him too. Ronald Searle, who is an artist that a lot of Disney artists uh, uh, refer to as being instrumental in their uh, stylization, uh, inspiration for stylization. Uh, Gerald Scarf, a lot of uh, what? We probably shouldn't record this, over that because you. We probably shouldn't record this, but I just I don't I, don't, I still don't get what Ronald Searle's in, uh, animation, his heavy animation influence is. If you look at, um, it's it's okay. You can record it. Oh uh, no! Well, that, if you look right at now. Milk Call's animation of Medusa, uh-huh. and you look at at uh, um, Searle's lines, those sweeping kind of. Uh, spidery lines mm-hmm. it, it's obvious in the shapes and the, the angularity it's obvious that that um, Searle was a huge influence on Milk Call I think probably more than any of the well also I think you could argue Ward Kimball was also tremendously influenced by Searle um, but there is the late period style came out of, uh, of Searle and um, okay he was a he was a cartoonist on Punch. Um, it's the first time I've ever heard that. What you just said, I know. Uh, everyone like, just says Ronald Searle, and yeah. there are people like, yeah. And then, <laughs> you know, I have no idea why or how. No, so well, that, well, that, get uh, Saint Trinian's the one of the Saint Trinian's books and and compare the shapes to um, to Milk Hall drawings of Medusa, and you'll and you'll immediately see what what you're looking at you know what i think we just did there change the world <laughs> no, no, no 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 i think we i think we followed a breadcrumb yeah that's exactly <laughs> it so punch was the british uh, magazine that set the standard in the turn of the century actually going back to the 1850s um in the united states it was uh judge magazine life magazine and puck those were the three big ones, and they were they were very different. The three of those magazines. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, Judge Magazine with uh, Eugene Zimmerman uh, on the website. 
the interesting thing about Judge is that it, it caricatured the common man. And Zimmerman was uh, instrumental in ethnic humor, the establishment of ethnic humor, which we think of today as being a bad thing. Again, it's got a negative mm -hmm. connotation. But at the time, New York City was a melting pot, and you would walk from a block, and you'd be going from the Italian neighborhood to the Jewish neighborhood, and the entire tone of the neighborhood would change. You'd walk from the Jewish neighborhood to the black neighborhood, and again, there would be a, a, a major change in, in the atmosphere. So you were seeing the entire world congregating in New York City, and it became a symbol of what America was. America wasn't uh, hundreds of years' history of, of being an Alsatian, for right. instance. It was, it was a million different kinds of people all coming together and working together and creating something entirely new. And Zimmerman uh, took that concept in his cartooning and lampooned the differences between people. And he didn't do it in a – you look at it and it, you can interpret it in a negative way. But there was a certain fondness behind it um, when Zimmerman would do ethnic humor in that he celebrated the differences between people. And it was the differences between people that made New York City so interesting. Now we try to celebrate the sameness of people. Right. No, that's a really good point. I don't want to tangent too much from that, but, you know, it always bugged me how, for some reason, illustration and and maybe this has more to do with the sort of kid friendliness that the corporatization of animation has really sort of created. But how is it that a movie like The Godfather, which is entirely based on on ethnic stereotypes, really, you know, in New York City, exactly like you're defining mm -hmm. in the Italian district, you know, with the Jews and the relationships between all these different people, it gets a free pass, but then, it, you know, critically, but then when you see a cartoon that has a similar Song exaggeration, of the South, which we'll never see. Song of the South, which is still refused to be released for some unforeseen reason to me, I, I don't understand. I've seen the movie. I think we've all seen the movie and yeah. it's, it's, I don't know. It's just not offensive. Well, I, I, I discovered one of the things that we collect here at the archive are, are cartooning courses. And I discovered a really interesting thing in – this is the craziest concept for a cartooning course ever. But it was trying to explain to you how to come up with gags for single panel cartoons. And what it was was the wheel of gags. <laughs> it sounds like I'm making this up. But it was the wheel of gags. And on this wheel were concepts – a uh, man stranded on a desert island, uh, a um, society matron uh, getting her comeuppance, you know, and it, all of these these archetypal concepts. And you would – there was a spinning arrow and you'd spin the arrow and that would be one concept and then you'd spin the arrow again to give you a second concept. So you'd have to combine the concept of society matron with man on a desert island. And that would spur your creativity to uh, uh, come up with a gag. Well, in the description of how to use the wheel of gags, it said, of course, if you can't come up with any kind of idea at all, ethnic stereotype gags like Negroes with watermelons mm -hmm. are always good for a, for a cheap laugh. And what it was was that they were using – using stereotyping, abusing stereotyping to create a gag that wasn't based on anything real. And that's the problem. When Eugene Zimmerman did a caricature, he went to a, a black church and he sat in the church and he drew the people that he saw and he put the people that he saw into his cartoon in Judge Magazine. There was an observation to it. There was an honesty to it. Mm -hmm. There was reality to it. There was caricature, but there was reality. What happened was later on, ethnic humor became a crutch. It became the, the gag that you did when you couldn't think of any other better gag. So the problem is that the baby gets thrown out with the bathwater. And the people who use stereotypes as a crutch uh, have 
colored the way that we look at stereotypes being used in an observational manner to show the unique attributes of a, of a culture. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I mean, that's, it's a difficult um, thing and it, yeah. and, and it, it always sparks controversy and I'm sure we're going to get some complaints. Yeah, probably people will get some comments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll get some comments finally. Well, I don't um, know. Anyway, sorry. But Eugene digress, Zimmerman but... is, is an interesting case because Eugene Zimmerman is a cartoonist who's been wiped out of history. He did ethnic humor, and at the point where ethnic humor became something that people were embarrassed about and and it had become abused and people didn't like it, they wrote his name out of history. He was the top cartoonist of his day. There was no one bigger than Eugene Zimmerman in his time. We brought but, him back. <laughs> yeah. There was no one bigger than him, but... If you read the histories of cartoonists at this point that talk about that period, he's listed, they skip over him to op, from Opper to the Yellow Kid and, and, and completely ignore what Zimmerman did. And because of the, you think because of the racial stereotyping, we just want to yeah. gloss over that. And he lived to the 1930s and I think it had begun that way. It became that way while he was still alive. Mm-hmm. So I think he was marginalized, and he knew it. That's yeah. rough. That that is rough. It, it is. But he, to the end of his days, he said that he always tried to be honest, and he always tried to be to embrace the people that he was making fun of. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is that he said, "Never caricature a woman." Oh, okay. He never did. He died. There are only a couple of drawings that he did of women. Uh huh. And he scrupulously avoided caricaturing women because he said that they, they didn't take it as well. <laughs> but he said that ethnic it's people. rife with stereotypes. He said that black people loved his drawings. Mm -hmm. And he said, in fact, his barber, the fellow that he saw every couple of weeks or every couple of months or every month, I, I don't get haircuts very often, <laughs> but his barber would pose for him and was probably the most famous black man of in America mm -hmm. because Zimmerman was constantly drawing him and putting him into the comics. So he, he related to these people. It wasn't something that, that he was making up out of his head, out of whole cloth. It, it was something that, that had an honesty and a reality to it. Well, if you can put your potentially offensive nature aside for a second and actually look at the stuff, when we sold out of the books that we yeah. printed... And you're going to... I'm going to be releasing the, the book in four parts as PDFs. Uh, it's too expensive to print the book. Digital printing is not, not where I want it to be. Mm -hmm. And we had to end up printing the book in four color to get the print quality that we wanted. And that was very expensive. Right. Even though it's a black and white book and you look at it and it's black and white, in order to get those ink lines smooth and clean, we had to print it with, with CMYK. So mm -hmm. it got very expensive. So that's Zimmerman. Life Magazine, that's Puck. Or, uh, Zimmerman was Puck. Uh, Life Magazine was more like The New Yorker. It was, uh, it was about society. But there was a cartoonist there, T.S. Sullivan, who um, Andreas Deja is a huge fan of him. Milk Call was a, was a fan of, of Sullivan. Bakshi's a fan of Sullivan. John Kay has, has cited Sullivan as being very important. Here's a cartoonist that is the foundation for Disney animal designs. If you look at Lion King, it's it's a, it's a direct relationship to the way T.S. Sullivan drew lions. He drew great caveman cartoons with dinosaurs and cavemen. He drew uh, amazing, fantastic animals in having tea parties. Hippopotamuses. Heinrich Clay is another artist that did a lot of things. Hippopotami. <laughs> Hippopotami. No, I, I totally am behind you on this one. I mean, T.S. Sullivan is great. You should be – listeners should be floored if they go – if you listen or follow up on one person. I think people would be surprised to know that one of the most influential designers responsible for The Lion King worked in 1910. It's amazing. That, yeah, it is. It's really was he astounding. was he like a Disney secret? Like, is is he one of the artists that Disney didn't talk about while he was making his films? Like, he didn't want 
people don't well, know? Well, no one was really interested on that level back in the day when Disney was making films. They, you know, they when they did the publicity, it was more like Uncle you know, I Walt came up with the idea with Mortimer Mouse on a train. You know, those kind of stories. Mm -hmm. They weren't really interested in the actual nuts and bolts of what inspired the artist to create what they wanted to create. One of the things that I found that was really interesting is we got a run of St. Nicholas magazine in, which was um, a premier children's magazine from the late 1800s to the early 1930s. And I'm reading it, and I'm looking at the pictures, and there's an account. It's an event. Uh, it had its adventure stories in it. There's an account of Livingston's trip to Africa, and I'm looking at it, and there's a boat with a with a striped canopy, and a guy shooting a pistol into a hippopotamus's mouth. Oh, wow! And then I turn the page, and there's a safari party up a tree <laughs> with <laughs> an animal down at the bottom that's got them treed. And I, I'm flipping through these pages, and every single page has a setup straight out of the Jungle Cruise at Disneyland. And at that moment, I suddenly realized the book I'm holding in my hand had to have been in the Disney Library mm -hmm. back in the in the 50s. So these guys knew this stuff. What I'm talking about now as being forgotten, it wasn't forgotten in the Disney Studio in 1955. And I think it's also important to to note that that doesn't necessarily take anything away from, you know, the design of Lion King or whatever. It's just important to know that these are the foundations. So if you want to do, if you want to be original, it's important to know where your craft is coming from or where it is, where the it originated. Continuity. Yeah. And that's what the archive is all about. Mm -hmm. uh, so that going back, we we're having fun here. This yeah. is great. <laughs> so that's life magazine, uh, T.S. Sullivan. Uh, Puck magazine was a little bit earlier than all of those. And Joseph Kepler was the cartoonist that was the head of Puck magazine. This was the classical political cartoon. He would do compositions that were almost uh, neoclassical in style with politicians wearing togas. But at the same time, he would be making fun of them and caricaturing them and making scathing comments on their politics. In fact, Kepler's Puck magazine was responsible for for winning the Grover Cleveland presidential election. Cleveland was running against uh, a fellow named James Blaine, who isn't remembered at all today. Everyone remembers Grover Cleveland. He wasn't that great of a, a president, I imagine. Yeah, but, uh, he was in that middle area. No one really... Yeah, he's the, he's the one that no one remembers. But he ran against James Blaine, and... Uh, a cartoonist who worked for Puck named uh, Bernhard Gillum did a comic called that he was captioned The Tattooed Man. And the image was of James Blaine with his shirt off, covered with tattoos. And the tattoos were words spelling out uh, scandals in his career. And he was surrounded by uh, circus freaks, midgets, fat ladies, skeleton men, the, the whole thing. He's in the middle of a circus sideshow, and here he is, the tattooed man, and across his chest is all of his his indiscretions written out uh, as the tattooed man. Well, I'm going to Disney T.S. Sullivan that one. That's a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> well, he, he this comic came out in, in uh, Puck Magazine, and by noon the entire print run had been sold out. And they started running the presses again and did a whole other print run and doubled their circulation on that one issue on the basis of that one cartoon. And afterwards, Blaine was quoted as saying that he believed that that cartoon had a great deal to do with him losing the election. The irony of the, the whole situation is that Gillum, the, the cartoonist that created that cartoon, voted for Blaine and was not a Grover Cleveland fan. On the basis of that, he left Puck Magazine and went on to form Judge Magazine. The manager of, of Puck Magazine got a raise based on the circulation rise on the, the uh, tattooed man furor, and uh, Gillum didn't get a raise, so he formed a whole new magazine that was the political opposite of of puck so 
you're saying that media organizations often have political affiliations. Absolutely. Interesting. <laughs> well, at least it's not like that now. No, yeah, thank God. I mean, this, God is, this is when, like, it. the Today, the news century. is entirely uh, neutral, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Objective <laughs> journalism. I, I kind of like the idea that you've got you know, we have a two-party system. Why shouldn't we have a shouldn't we have a two-party newscast, uh, an individual party for each cat newscast? The there is no objective objective truth in the world, as, as philosophers will tell you. So I think it's better to express a, a point of view uh, clearly and consistently, and then you understand where that person's coming from. But that's just my own opinion. If this were a political podcast, I would jump right on. <laughs> Well, well of course, even the I, in the ideal world, everyone agrees with me. Right. <laughs> well, that's what we're trying to do here, right. Steve. So, I'm just going to let it go. Again, we're, we're seeing that cartoonists are at the very core of, of the political landscape of America. And the next story I'm going to tell you here is the, the king of all of the cartoonists with power. And that's the story of Thomas Nast, who is a cartoonist for Harper's Weekly. He's also the illustrator that created our conception of Santa Claus. Uh, he took some obscure Norwegian folk tale and made it into something that has become part of Christmas to this day. You mean he didn't just take a photo of the actual Santa Claus? Maybe, <laughs> maybe we should put a disclaimer at the intro. This, if you're under 18. 18. <laughs> What? Sorry, I don't mean to cut learner. you off there. Created the Santa Claus image. <laughs> I don't mean to burst your bubble. Well, in any case, uh, <laughs> where are we now? Thomas Nast. Uh, Thoroughly embarrassed. The the political force that he went up against was a fellow named Boss Tweed, and you know when you've got a name like Boss Tweed that you're you're not going to be the most altruistic of people. I'm still scared. <laughs> He was the head of uh, the Tammany Hall Ring, which was a huge political force in New York City that pretty much owned the police department. Uh, if Tammany Hall said to the trash collectors, don't pick up the trash, the trash didn't get picked up. It was, it was a pervasive power, uh, a third party that uh, pretty much controlled New York City. When is this? This is in the 1850s, I would guess, 1940s, 1850s, somewhere around there. Nast was a political cartoonist, and he saw this as an injustice, and, and he was living in America, and he believed that America should be representative of the people. So obviously, uh, political corruption like this is something that he wanted to speak out against. Well, his talents were so powerful that his cartoons started really cutting into Boss Tweed's operation. And uh, at one point, Boss Tweed sent a one of his goons to Thomas Nast to convince him to stop caricaturing him in Harper's Weekly. And I have a copy here of Thomas Nast's biography, if you'll excuse me for a moment, I'll read a couple of paragraphs here, that is a uh, an account of the meeting between Thomas Nast and the representative of Boss Tweed. A lawyer friend one day intimated to Nast that in appreciation of his great efforts, a party of rich men wished to send him abroad to give him a chance to study art under the world's great masters. The friend was probably innocent enough, an unconscious tool of the ring. Nast said very little except that he appreciated the offer and would be delighted to go but for the fact that he had important business just then in New York. He fancied that he detected the far faint odor of a mouse under the idea, but he did not mention this to his friend. On the following Sunday, an officer of the Broadway bank where the ring kept its accounts called on Nast at his home. He talked of a number of things. Then he said, I hear you've been made an offer to go abroad for art study. Yes, nodded Nast. But I can't go. I haven't the time. But they will pay you for the time. I have reason to believe you could get $100,000 for that trip. Do you think I could get 200000 Nast replied. Well, possibly. I believe 
from what I've heard in the bank that you you might be able to get it. You have great talent, but you need study and you need rest. Besides, this ring business will get you into trouble. They own all the judges and jurors and can get you locked up for libel. My advice is to take the money and get away. Nast looked out into the street and perhaps wondered what $200,000 would do for him. It would pay the mortgage on his house in the city. It would give him years of study abroad. It would make him comfortable for life. He thought about it, and presently he said, Do you think I could get 500000 to make that trip? The bank official scarcely hesitated. You can. You can get $500,000 in gold to drop this ring business and get out of the country. Nast laughed a little. He'd played the game far enough. Well, I don't think I'll do it, he said. I made up my mind not long ago to put some of those fellows behind bars, and I'm going to put them there. The banker rose rather quietly. Only be careful, Mr. Nast, that you do not first put yourself in a coffin. He smiled and left. It was not until two years later that Nast met him one day on Broadway. My God, Nast, he said, you did it after all. He did. He drove Boss Tweed out of the country, and Tweed fled to Spain and tried to live in Spain, but on the basis of Nast's cartoons, which had been syndicated to newspapers in Spain, he was recognized in Spain and hounded out of Spain. That whole thing is absolutely incredible. And that's the that's the creator of the contemporary image of Santa Claus. Being offered a bribe of $500,000 in, in 1850. 1850. I Before don't Before income taxes. In gold. $500,000 in gold. It's just on... And... Until a few months ago, when when we you know you were bringing this to our attention, I had never even heard of the person before. I, imagine the the strength to be able to turn down five hundred thousand dollars, right? And imagine the power to be able to change an entire corrupt government. That's the power of cartooning, and that's what is the most important lesson of the history of cartooning is that it's not just ducks and bunnies. It's There's a lot more to it than that. Nat is, Nast is the poster child for what cartooning can be and should be. And you read that out of a first edition volume of... This is uh, Thomas Nast, His Period and His Pictures by Arthur Bigelow Payne from 1904. Great book. That's story time with Steve. Story time with Steve. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Negate it that way. <laughs> so that gives you an idea of how important cartoonists were in the mid-19th century. And up until about six or eight weeks ago, I thought Nast was the beginning of the story. The same way that Four years ago, I thought Windsor McKay was the beginning of the story. But I'm finding out now that it goes back even further. Gustave Doré in the 1840s did a book called Grotesque Caricatures that is dead to rights cartooning. I saw a documentary by uh, Robert Hughes, who was the, the art critic for the Time magazine for many years. And he spoke about Goya's caprichos, which were prints, engravings that, that Goya did around the, the, around, I believe, 1790 or, or 1800, somewhere around then. It was a, a set of prints that uh, lampooned and condemned Spanish society. They were printed inexpensively and sold to the general public. It was a precursor not just to single panel cartoons, which they exactly resemble, but to modern art in general. Robert Hughes has said that they're among the most important art of all time. They're devastating. If you look at them, the caricatures, the commentary, the satire is tremendously devastating. And Goya said himself that they were they expunged 
from himself some of his madness in these cartoons. He described them as being about the innumerable foibles and follies to be found in civilized society and from the common prejudice and deceitful practices which custom, ignorance, and self-interest have made usual. Now, if that's not a definition of a satirical comic, I don't know what is. He made fun of, of the common man's fear of witchcraft. He made fun of, uh, of political figures. He made fun of government corruption. He made fun of the, the clergy. He made fun of, of uh, wealthy society. At the same time as he was working as an artist painting portraits for the wealthy society, he he is definitely one of the early cartoonists that I don't know of any book that cites him as being as being a cartoonist. But Goya, uh, Bakshi is the one that told me look closer into Goya. It, it, he's he's absolutely astounding. He did another set of engravings after that, the Caprichos that dealt with war, that are some of the most horrifying images ever, and would make the average uh, graphic novel or anime look pale in comparison to. So it's not cartooning in the sense that it's big noses and broad eyes. It's just cartooning in, in how it's conveyed? It's not funny ha-ha cartooning. Right. What it is is it's caricature and satire and using clarity of composition and uh, pointing satire to comment on society, which is what what early cartooning was all about. Mm -hmm. In America in the late 1700s, is that right? No, Goya was Spanish. Yeah, Goya was Oops. Spanish. That's okay. It, it, it's all right to be ignorant. Ignorance is curable. I, I've learned that many many times myself. <laughs> I keep, I'm, Mark Twain said, uh, and I don't want to be Chuck Jones about this, quoting Mark Twain, but Mark Twain said, uh, uh, everyone is ignorant just on different subjects. Right. And I, I think that's really good. I, I don't see anything wrong with not knowing Except something. That I, I demonstrate myself to be ignorant on the subject I'm supposed to have some of. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm supposed to know about it, not you. Okay. I, I'm the one that, right. that can kick myself. So, so that's the that's around uh, 1790, 1800, the mid 1700s. This is the area that I've just discovered, and uh, again, I've been talking with Bakshi about it because. Uh, Bakshi has a tremendous library of, of cartooning and and has a, a really encyclopedic knowledge of of the breadth of, of what cartooning was and is and can be. Thomas Rowlinson in England, George Cruikshank, who was a friend of Dickens and illustrated some of the Dickens novels. Uh, Cruikshank, where Dickens was a caricaturist in words, Cruikshank was a, a caricaturist in images, and they worked together to to create a caricature of English society at that time. But probably the most important one at that point was uh, James Gilray. And Gilray was a bit of a superstar of his time. Crowds would form outside the shop window of the uh, publisher that published his, his lithographic uh, or engraving prints. This is before lithography. The crowds would form outside the window uh, of the publisher uh, that published his engravings just to see the latest prints that were that he had done he would do satire of not just politics but social manners he did dirty jokes he did gross jokes with one of his famous ones is a depiction of gout with this little monster biting on a swollen foot with a huge sore on it <laughs> nasty looking thing it's like a ren and stimpy um, gross out, you know, where, where they'd have those panels where it would be a close up of Wren's teeth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, Gilray did those in, in the uh, mid 1700s. Then you go back to the early 1700s and William Hogarth, who, who created satirical prints about the stock mar market crash of 1720. Now, how modern does that sound? He did prints on, uh, the addiction of his society to hard liquor. One of them, there were, it was a pair of prints. One was called Gin Lane, and the other one was called Beer Street. And the image of Gin Lane 
was of a woman sitting on steps, totally drunk, dropping her baby over the edge of a, of a precipice as horrible debauchery happens in the street and everyone's drunk and falling down and, and uh, in all sorts of depravity. While the British uh, Beer Street is, is the height of civility with lords and ladies drinking beer happily in, in beautiful surroundings. So he was commenting on the difference between beer and hard liquor and using it to talk about the differences in society at the same time. Amazing, amazing sense of caricature and amazing sense of social commentary in his work. I'm just learning about him. I got a book coming in the mail. I can't wait to, to get it. I get really excited when I learn about new cartoonists. It's like, oh, here's something else to chase down. Mm -hmm. And I've got a book at Christmas time, a huge Tashin book on Leonardo da Vinci. It's like 1,500 pounds just to pick the thing up and set it on the table. <laughs> but the, the interesting thing about it is that I'm looking through it, and in his sketchbooks, there are caricatures. So Leonardo da Vinci, who lived in the late 15th century, 1480s, 1490s, was doing caricatures. So it's clear that the thread of caricature goes back even further than what we have documentation of. The reason that we know about Hogarth and Gilray and Cruikshank and Rowlandson and these other early cartoonists is that they did prints. They did engravings, and there were thousands and thousands of copies of them, where before that, an artist would do one drawing, and when that drawing disappeared or was destroyed or was lost, we don't know about it anymore. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times what we know as history is only history because someone bothered to reproduce it. So again, here at the archive, that's what we're doing. We're trying to digitally reproduce as much stuff as we can so that it won't disappear, so that it can continue to inform um, other artists. So not to say that Da Vinci is the father of cartooning, but he, as far back as so far that you've studied? No, it, ju it just it shows seen. that cartooning existed right. in Da Vinci's, or caricature at least. Mm -hmm. That element of cartooning existed in Da Vinci's time. It may go back even further. It's, it's hard to say. And if you look at uh, paintings by Hieronymus Bosch, there's definitely a cartoony aspect to those. Um, Bruegel. Art and is something where there are never any hard and fast lines and there's never any first, here's the first of anything. It's, it's a continuum and it's a, a way of thinking that artists have among themselves that, that passes from one artist to another by looking at each other's work and thinking about it and analyzing it. Do you think that animation is the natural evolution of cartooning? Yes. A animation is the continuum. It's, it's a modern technological continuum of cartooning. And a lot of animators think of themselves as animators in the sense of the Windsor McKay to today when they should be thinking of themselves not just as cartoonists, which goes back to da Vinci or whatever, but as artists, and when you think of yourself as all of these things, mm -hmm. then you realize the power that animation has. When you harness the power of caricature and satire that was uh, the, the tools that Mad Magazine used and the tools that Thomas Nast used to make fun of society and to illuminate truth, animation should be doing that too. Animation is part of that continuity. Animation has the power to make caricature move and come to life. So it should be even more powerful. Mm -hmm. It's really kind of a paradigm shift to go from thinking animation as movement to animation as... Statement. Know, statement, yeah. Not to say that animators are so naive as to think that they can't accomplish anything with animation, but... A lot of times they don't even try. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that that's the problem. They, they, they may not even realize the power that they hold. Maybe, maybe they're afraid of it. Well, I had a phone call the other day from Ralph Bakshi, and, and we were talking about when he was a kid in Brownsville. It was a rough neighborhood 
and he would do comic strips that he'd ink on on Bristol board. And when he went through the neighborhood, he didn't want to carry them because he'd get beat up. So he'd wrap them around his chest inside his shirt. And he told me the story on the phone. And I, I started laughing and I said, you know, there are a lot of of uh, animators nowadays days who are ashamed, maybe not ashamed, but they're afraid to be cartoonists when they go to work to animate. Um, there's, I, I know animators who go to work and work on realistic uh, folds and, and fabric and wrinkles and, and hair and dripping water and uh, animate flapping lips of characters making meaningless gestures, topical dialogue jokes that go home and then create incredibly funny, poignant, meaningful, hilarious drawings for themselves that no one ever sees. And this is kind of where animation has gone. And I, I remember a quote back when I first got on the internet, Chris Bailey, who is an animation director, a great animation director, has done a lot of commercials, did the recent Chipmunk movie. He uh, had a quote in his signature line back when I remember seeing him on, on the internet. And the quote was, I love cartoons, but I'm not so sure about animation. And when I first saw that, I, I read it and I went, what? And then I realized cartoons and animation are two different things. And what, what I'm finding now in this history that I've, I've uncovered is that the power is in the cartooning. It's not in the animation. The animation is just a technique. It's just making it move. Making it live is in, in the cartooning. It's in the satire and exaggeration. And Ralph said, you know, you may have a point there. And I said, well, how do we change that? How do, how do we bring cartooning back to be at the forefront instead of something we hide under our shirts? And Ralph got quiet and he said, you know, it may not be possible. Society just doesn't value cartooning anymore. And there's a truth to that. In the, in the 30s, Newspaper comics, for instance, the people who made newspaper comics were stars. Walt Kelly, Al Cap, and Milton Kniff, they all made a million dollars a year. They all drove Cadillacs and lived in penthouses. They had, they had the eyes and, and minds of America. Millions of people read their comic every single day of the year. 365 days a year and in color on Sundays. They were reading what Walt Kelly Alcap and Milton Kniff had to say. Those guys were heroes. Jack Kirby was a hero, creating Marvel Comics. So was Wally Wood. And, and the whole gang, they call themselves the usual gang of idiots at Mad Magazine. Those guys were heroes. When I was a kid, we worshipped the guys at Mad Magazine. We, we knew their names and we, we knew the style and we, you know, Don Martin. I'd go crazy over Don Martin when I was a kid. Shika Shika and, and Fwap Fwap and all his sound effects and everything. People would line up to see Gilray's engravings. And Thomas Nast, we just heard, changed the face of New York City politics all by drawing cartoons. But today, cartoonists struggle to make a living. There are no more newspaper comics. There are, there are, but they're a pale shadow of what they used to be. Magazine comics have been replaced by, by photographs and, and uh, uh, Photoshop collages. Animation, instead of being Pinocchio and Fantasia, is South Park and, and Family Guy with all of the cartooning and the drawing whittled away until it's just dialogue and jokes and no expression through the drawings at all. Animation has become, well, in CGI, you have all the focus on, on, on fabrics and, and textures and, 
that sort of thing. It, it's become a technical exercise and all the creativity is in the writing of the story on a typewriter and in the lines of dialogue that are read by someone who, who acts into a microphone. And the creativity in the drawing is marginalized and it's being whittled away bit by bit. And you add to this the problem that the audience has become distanced from the creator. I read an interview with, um, with uh, Friz Freeling where he said that he'd go down to the Alex Theater in Glendale and he'd slip the projectionist five bucks and give him a print of his latest Bugs Bunny cartoon and he'd have the projectionist run it and he'd sit in the back of the audience with a notepad and he'd take notes on what worked and what didn't work and then go back and apply that when he was ready for the next uh, uh, next cartoon. Nowadays we have television where the, the audience is a million miles away. There's no way to reach them. We have to hire study groups uh, to do focus testing to tell us what our audience thinks, whether they think a joke is funny. How does a, a creator learn from back and forth interaction with his audience when there's no feedback? Audiences don't realize this. They don't care. They just observe whatever is given to them. Cartoons have been relegated to being kitty fair. And that's probably the worst thing that's happened in the history of cartooning is that cartoons are now think thought of as trivial kitty pap. When we look at the history and we know Thomas Nast and we know Louis Remaker and then we know, you know, My Little Pony and, and uh, the, the Fluffy Dogs. What have we done? Why, why have we turned the most powerful art form for satire and social change into talking dogs and princesses singing about finding a prince. Television is going downhill. The, the ratings today are nothing like the ratings that they were just five years ago. Theatrical animation costs hundreds of millions of dollars to make. It's incredibly complicated and every day it gets more and more realistic and less cartoony. Animation is being turned into a trade. And as soon as it becomes completely mechanical, we can ship it all off to India or Korea or whatever country to do it because we don't need to do it ourselves anymore. What have we done? <laughs> Are you depressed yet? I'm looking forward to getting that job at the bank. I always <laughs> Next so, so the question is, and this is what I asked Ralph, is how do we change this? And he said he didn't know. He said it may not be possible. I have heard from several major animators and cartoonists that they are afraid that the art form may be dying. That's, that's a knife right in my heart to hear that. So I, I'm here doing whatever I can to change that. So how do we change that? Well, that was one of the things I asked Bakshi at the Comic-Con a few years back. And if you've seen that video, he talks about doing it yourself and, and getting a computer and a, a group of artists together to, to just make something, good or bad or indifferent, just make something so that you're, you're working and, and creating something that belongs to you. Um, it's perfectly possible with computers and technology to make fairly large-scale animation on your own without the big studio budgets and backing. This is something that in the last five or ten years is completely different than animation going back to Windsor McKay. In the past you had to do uh, send film out to a lab, you had to have a camera stand, you had an oh, ink and paint department. It took hundreds of people to do what you can do on a laptop today. The internet is something that is miraculous. It's free distribution. We don't need to own movie theaters. We don't need to own television networks. We don't need to, to uh, own art galleries. We just put it on the internet, and there it is, and anyone anywhere in the world can reach it. No focus groups. <laughs> yeah, no focus groups. 
And people can email us and tell us what they think of it. So life is good. Life is good. But when kids come into the archive and they ask me, what do I do to get into animation? You know, and I want to, you know, I want to become an animator and it's my passion and I want to make films that I want to make. And I understand that 100%. And they say they've heard Bakshi's speech and they're inspired. The one part that they haven't heard and that everyone ignores is the part where he talks about money. He jokes, find a rich wife and live off her for a few years. And he says, go ahead and starve. It's honorable. Now that's true. It, it, it's true. You're doing what you have to do. It's honorable. But why do you have to starve? The, the problem is, is that the internet, as good as it is about distribution and as good as it is about technology, there's very little way to make money on it fairly. Certainly not to the scale of theatrical animation or even comic strips back in the 30s where Milton Kniff was making a million dollars a year. There are no cartoonists doing web comics making a million dollars a year today, even not adjusting for inflation. So there's a big problem there. Uh, the audience on the internet expects for content to be free and doesn't want to look at advertising. They reject it. So who's going to pay the rent? Who's going to Who's going to put the bread on the cartoonist table? Well, there are options and compromises and trade-offs and different choices to be made. The best way I've found to figure those things out is to look at history. And so let's look at it. Here's a couple of examples. For instance, uh, Bob Clampett at... Bob Clampett at Warner Brothers created the most sophisticated cartoons of the Golden Age. His Bugs Bunny cartoons and his Daffy Duck cartoons were incredible. They merged Carl Stallings' orchestral music with uh, an entirely new way of moving characters expressively and exaggerated and caricatured and with humor and with comment on society. He did it all. Do any specific cartoons come to mind? Baby Bottleneck, uh, Book Review, uh, Great Piggy Bank Robbery. Um, Clampett was, was incredible. You look at the at just about any Clampett cartoon. He had a few clinkers, but, but uh, on the whole, he, he batted really high. Uh, his cartoons were a pinnacle of, of animation sophistication. And in 1946, Leon Schlesinger, who was the head of the studio, left, and Clampett was left in a lurch because he was very close with Schlesinger, and the incoming management didn't feel as fondly about him. So he left at that point. He tried working at other studios. He worked at uh, Screen Gems, Columbia, for a while. Uh, did a cartoon there, and it didn't really work out. He worked at Republic Pictures doing um, gags for, for live-action serials, I believe, or something like that. But that didn't really work out. So what he did is he looked like we look to the Internet, to television. This is in, around 1949, 1950. Looked to television and said, okay, here's a new technology. What can I do for this? Television was on a minute scale at the time. So he created a puppet show. With a puppet show, he could still tell stories. He could still have fun, make satirical jabs at things, have great voice talent, have funny stories and, and situations and exaggerated caricatures and, and uh, personalities. He just didn't have the big studio behind him. So he didn't have full animation and Carl Stallings' lush orchestral scores. He created an incredible puppet show, one of the greatest television puppet shows of all time, Time for Beanie. Albert Einstein 
in the middle of one of his lectures, stopped and looked at his watch and said, excuse me, gentlemen, but I have to leave. It's time for Beanie. <laughs> And went to watch. He never missed a Beanie and Cecil. Albert Einstein. It was a huge show. And it made him some money. But when you think about it, where Clampett was in 1946 at Warner Brothers, and a few years later he's doing a puppet show, what could he have done if Warner Brothers had continued? What could he have done if the theatrical uh, market had continued to grow? Where would he have been? And he would have gotten greater and greater and the mind boggles as to where animation would be today. So there's something there was compromised and something there was lost and it's a, it's a shame. It may not have been able to have been changed but it's something to think about. The other option, if you don't want to make any compromises at all, and you just want to do what you have a passion for to create your masterpiece. A good example of that is a classical composer. Musicians are in the exact same place, by the way, as, as uh, uh, cartoonists. It's very difficult to be an independent musician in America today. Um, in the 30s, there were pit orchestras at every theater, jobs for musicians at nightclubs, People listen to live music. Today, everything's canned. There are five musicians on the radio that take up 80% of popular culture. It, it's not the same market as it, as it was. So music is very similar to, to animation in that sense. Charles Ives was a classical composer. He went to Yale and studied music, wrote a symphony, um, I guess around 1909, 1910, something like that, and wanted to be a classical composer. Now, unfortunately, he was a classical composer who wanted to do avant-garde modern music, create his own sound in America in 1910. In America, there were very few symphony orchestras at that time. And the ones that were in existence were primarily playing 100-year-old mu music for society ladies who wanted to feel high class listening to European music. They had no interest at all in avant-garde American composers. What would he do? In Paris, at the same time, Igor Stravinsky was doing uh, the Rite of Spring and creating a riot. And European culture accepted that because European culture was open to modernism and abstraction and uh, Picasso was happening at the exact same time as Stravinsky. It was a whole culture that supported that. Here's Charles Ives trying to do the same thing in America on the other side of the planet where culture is totally against it. What did he do? He became an insurance salesman. A really successful insurance salesman. He created his own insurance company and he, he sold insurance policies and he made it enough money to be comfortable. And he took that money and every spare moment he composed. He composed like a madman when he wasn't having nervous breakdowns. In between 1906 and 1926, he composed amazing works, symphonies, uh, vocal works, chamber works, um, major pieces like Central Park in the Dark, The Unanswered Question, uh, Three Places in New England, major, major modern works. He'd occasionally hire a musician to perform bits of it for him so he'd know what it sounded like. But most of it was entirely in his head. He would 
transcribe the music and score it for full orchestra on uh, paper. And then he'd take the paper and he'd put it in a trunk. And he put it in a trunk for 20 years. Music he never even heard. And 20 years went by after that. 1946, this is 40 years after he began, began composing and 20 years after he stopped composing. 1946, a conductor stumbles across his music and performs a, uh, a premiere of his symphony. Immediately, it becomes a huge thing in the music world. Here is an undiscovered modern genius that we didn't even know we had here in America. By this point, America was open to modern classical music. He won a Pulitzer Prize a year later. Bernard Herrmann, the man who uh, composed the Psycho soundtrack, cited him as being one of his major influences and one of the most important musicians in America. Arnold Schoenberg, who created 12-tone row and was probably the most celebrated modern composer of that time, called him a monument to artistic integrity. A monument to artistic integrity. That's for a person to be a monument to artistic integrity, that's a, that is astounding. His work got performed by New York Philharmonic, by Leonard Bernstein, by Leopold Stokowski, and in 1954, he died. 1946, his work was discovered. 1954, he died. 1906, he started composing. 1926, his, his career composing was finished. He never compromised. He created masterpieces. And for eight years, he was recognized. Of his entire life, eight years. He didn't even hear his symphony performed until 1946. There's, a, there's some pretty strong what ifs there too just like Clampett. So what do you do? Do you scale yourself back like Clampett did? Do you not scale yourself back and not compromise at all like Charles Ives did? I, I'm not going to be able to be the one to tell you that. Every artist has to make those kind of decisions for themselves. There are plus and minus to both sides. But the thing is, is and I, I need to say this, is that Cartooning, and when I say that, I'm using the term in the centuries-old context that I've gone over here. Cartooning is in trouble. And I'm dead serious when I say it might not survive. Now, who knows? it? The essence of caricature and making fun of things and making points politically and... and all that's part of the human spirit. I don't. I, maybe it's not possible to entirely kill it, but it could certainly go into a dormant state. And it would be a shame for an art form as powerful as cartooning and a technique, a technical process as amazing as animation and a distribution method as widespread as the internet and a technology as great as computers to create animation, it would be a tragedy for all of that to go to waste. So it's up to cartoonists to take back their art form and for animators to see themselves as cartoonists and change things to the way they should be. Amen. <laughs>